Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for in the invitation. I suppose Daniel and Jan at least. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so that's the, the title is about Liouville conformal field theory. And this is joint work uh, with the Colin Guillermo, Remy Rod, and Vasa Vargas. And at least I think Remy is there in the in the audience. Okay, so let, let's start uh, from scratch. Okay, so uh, one could talk about quantum field theory, uh, at least two points of view. So uh, at least historically, there, there has been an axiomatic approach where one makes some axioms about what uh, the thing is about, or should be should, what, uh, sort of minimal requirements, what quantum field theory should uh, should uh, uh, satisfy and uh, and uh, <coughs> so everybody uh, at IMP at least probably knows about Whiteman axioms, Osterwald, Schrader, Hug, Kastler, etc. Uh, in in more restricted uh, uh, cases like conformal field theory, there are there is an ax sort of axiomatic scheme by Valerian, Polyakov, and Shabalochikov, and that's actually what I will be talking about today. Uh, so in these cases, especially in the latter one, uh, one could say that uh, the, the approach has been more, uh, more algebraic and sometimes, especially in the latter case, it has been leading even to explicit formulae. Now then there is the other approach which <coughs> one could call co constructive. So you would li uh, like to find examples, satisfies axioms and actually actually realistic field theories like QED or QCD or something like that. And in that case, uh, one talks about action functionals, path integrals, renormalization group, things like that. And uh, the approaches and methods are typically analytic, approximative, and, and often, <coughs> often what you, in the end, if you understand anything, it will be mostly perturbative. So what I want to talk about here is uh, sort of a bridge between these two, namely going from the constructive to the explicit formulae, or if you wish to the axiomatic from that point of view, within a, a particular uh, conformal field theory, the, uh, the Lewis conformal field theory. So, uh, Euclidean quantum field theory is what, what uh, this talk mostly is about. Uh, it deals, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's related to quantum field theory by analytic continuation, but it also models statistical physics. And, and uh, statistical physics problems at critical temperature are scale invariant and actually Actually, they, they are not only scale invariant, but conformal invariant. And the corresponding quantum field theory in that case is conformal field theory. And uh, there is more symmetry here, and, and this gives sort of more constraints on actually what correlation functions, for instance, can look like in such theories. And, and, <coughs> and usually, these constraints go under the name conformal bootstrap. Uh, and especially if you work in two dimensions, then the bootstrap was very successful in the 80s. It was uh, by, by the work of Beliarin, Polyakov, and Zamalachikov, uh, who, who used this idea to classify conformal field theories and actually find explicit expressions for correlation functions of, of these theories. And uh, uh, much more recently, uh, this bootstrap idea was spectacularly su successful in more realistic, uh, physically more realistic cases of higher dimensional uh, <coughs> conformal field theories, like, like for instance, the three dimensional easy model. Now, I want to. Uh, 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 give a sort of a minimal fast uh, uh, review what the axiom, what, what sort of the Belyabin polyakov homological axioms are. Uh, so if you have never seen it, take it sort of a bit impressionistically. In the end, we are going to very concrete uh, uh, field theory <coughs> later. So uh, 
this is in two dimensions and conformal means that it's sort of natural to do it on, on two dimensional surfaces. So let, let's take a two dimensional surface, uh, compact for, the, for this talk and, uh, and a Riemannian metric on it. And, uh, and then uh, uh, it's a field theory, so somehow, or, or Euclidean field theory, so, so you should have something like expectation, which produces, you put, uh, pro produces, for instance, correlation functions. And then you should have fields, and uh, in the form of field theory, there are uh, uh, very important fields, so called primary fields, which I will uh, in this talk always denote by V alpha of Z, so they are uh, fields defined on the, on the on the space on the surface, and uh, attached to them are numbers which are called conformal weights. And, and the axioms, the first axioms are the following, uh, uh, the correlation functions, so you are interested in putting these primary fields into expectation, the correlation functions should be invariant or covariant under diffeomorphism. So if you move the points, it should be the same as not moving them, but moving the metric. So this is for fields which don't have spin. So let's, 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 let's be as simple as possible. And uh, then there is another in, uh, important transformation here, which is, which is uh, multiplying the metric by a positive function. So that's so-called while transformation. And in conformal field theory, uh, again, the transformation law is very simple. So the fields, uh, at the points where the fields are, you get you get the multiplicative factor uh, depending on these conformal weights, and uh, and then uh, there is an overall factor coming in front of everything, uh, which is called the conformal anomaly. So it's a concrete functional of the vial transformation you are doing. Okay, and uh, this is the same for all conformal field theories except that. The co there is a coefficient which changes, and that's the so-called central charge of the conformal field theory, which classifies the conformal field theories in certain sense. All right, so this this is this says that they are sort of naturally geometrically defined. Uh, uh, now, the most one of the most important points here are the structure constants. Okay, so uh, let's let's take now in two dimension take the space the two-dimensional sphere. So uh, if you're on the two-dimensional sphere, uh, every Riemannian metric, you can, you can sort of globally go to coordinates where it, it sort of looks like any other uh, module of this wild transformation. So, so there is a uh, diffeomorphism and wild transformation. So that any, two, any two smooth metrics can be related to each other. So you can ask, well, since, since we have these transformation laws here, we can ask, well, well, choose our favorite one. Let me call it G hat. And, and uh, uh, once you fix such a one, there is still a three parameter group of transformations which fixes it. So these are the familiar Möbius transformations if you take a round metric on the sphere, for instance. What does it mean? It means that these three point functions, uh, by, since you have three points and you have three parameters, they are fixed up to a constant, okay? So the dependence on the points is completely determined and then there is an overall constant. Uh, and this constant is called the structure constant. It, so it depends on the, on the, what the, actually on the, conform, uh, on the uh, of course, on the, what the conformal field theory is, and, but also what particular uh, primary fields you have here. Okay, so that's the first point. Now the bootstrap is the following thing. Okay? So it starts from something which, again, if, uh, if, uh, which has been around in quantum field theory a long time. And if you take two of these local fields, these Vs, uh, and insert them in correlation functions, uh, what should happen is that uh, you can sort of fuse them together and the result can be expressed in terms of, again, in terms of these same fields. So that's called the operator product expansion. And, and uh, so it's saying that if you take two Vs, uh, then their product is the same as sum of these 
and the certain coefficients which actually are differential operators, but let's not be so explicit here. Uh, what's important is that once you insert this expansion into correlation functions, uh, what happens is that if you have an endpoint correlation function, then you can reduce it to n minus one point correlation functions with co explicit coefficients. And these coefficients are completely explicit and determined by the structure constants. So determined by these C's, which I had on the previous slide. Uh, but there is a sum over, over these primary fields, certain, certain primary fields, and this uh, index, which is indexing these pri primary fields, which enter in this sum, uh, this is called the spectrum of the conformal field theory. So if you iterate this formula, every correlation function is determined in terms of structure constants and one point functions on the surface and in particular if you are on the sphere which the setup if you are doing statistical mechanics in the usual plane then uh, only the structure constants enter because uh, you can reduce all, all of them to just three three point functions so you could say that uh, this is what usually uh, people say uh, to solve a conformal field theory you need to find its spectrum and its structure constants and if you have if you find them then you get all the correlation functions now how do you find them okay uh, the bootstrap refer refers to uh, one way of looking at this uh, uh, <coughs> this reduction from uh, n point to n minus one point. So take the four point function. You could try to sort of fuse the fir first two guys together, like here, or you could fuse the last two guys together. Or I think I, no, I think I fused the first and the and the third together. So then I get uh, uh, two different uh, expansions, which are both qu uh, quadratic in the structure constants. So this is a quadratic equation for the C's. And actually it has, this equation has been extremely uh, uh, constraining even in the case of, of higher dimensional conformal field theories, namely three dimensional Ising model for, for instance, as many of you probably know. Now, <clears throat> what are the solutions, okay? Uh, and here one could uh, sort of compare with uh, uh, harmonic analysis. So uh, there are something which one could call compact, compact conformal field theories, where the spectrum, this number of fields which enter into this operator production expansion, it's finite. So this is the case uh, uh, of uh, what Bellevue and Palikov and Zamolochikov find, found in, uh, in the 80s. They found this finite spectrum case, which is, the, which is called the minimal models. For instance, easing model is one of those. Oh, there's another, so this is sort of discrete spectrum, either finite or, or countable, but still discrete. So such theories are the, for instance, uh, sigma models, this uh, WZW models or the Cosset theories. And in all these cases, one can, uh, there are formulae for the structure constants in terms of Coulomb gas integrals. They go back to Dotsenko and Fateyev and many people afterwards. But then there are also, like in, like in, uh, like in Lie groups, you can, you, you, you can have compact groups, but you can also have non-compact ones. And uh, then the spectrum here is continuous. So there are, there's a continuous number of this these um, uh, fields which enter into the spectral, uh, into the operator product expansion. And examples of, of such models are, again, the WZW models, but on non compact groups, then Liouville model, TODA, conformal field theories, and, and others. Now, in, uh, what I will be talking about is the Liouville model. And, uh, in the Liouville case, the explicit formula for the, uh, for the structure constants was found 
in the mid 90s by Dorn and Otto and Zamologikov and Zamologikov. It goes under the name DOZZ for because of these names. Uh, but uh, this is the topic of, of the talk here. Okay, so that's the end of the uh, axiomatic. Okay, so you, have, you put some of these, uh, these axioms, but basically uh, the operator product expansion. Uh, you come up with the idea of structure constants and spectrum, and then you try to find sort of them one way or the other. Constructive approach, of course, would be a bit different, at least uh, uh, historically. So you try to find examples satisfying axioms by functional integrals. So, so now this, this bracket and the product of the alphas should be given by a functional integral where you integrate over some fields, let me call them capital X, you weight them by some Gibbs factor, and then the V alphas are then some function, functionals of the, of the fields X. So very familiar to many people in quantum field theory certainly are uh, the ones which would <coughs> produce minimal models. In this case, you would just take um, fields for taking real values, and you take the P phi, P phi 2 model, or P X 2 model in this notation, where the nonlinearity is a polynomial, and, and uh, also the primary fields are polynomials in the, in the X. And then uh, the conformal field theory would be the scaling limit of, of this thing if you choose your polynomial so that the theory is critical. Well, that's not very easy uh, to find that, but, well, to put it mildly, and this is not the approach which has been successful in finding minimal models. WZW models, it's, it was slightly uh, more interesting, this uh, also the functional integral approach, but, but uh, still really, uh, uh, really to do the functional integral from first principles is uh, Let's, let me just say that it's not completely obvious. So let's go to the Liouville model. <clears throat> so the Liouville model is the following. Uh, the action function is uh, uh, resembling the P phi, except that instead of polynomial, you take the exponential of the field. So, so you have a field X defined on your surface, taking real values. And the action function now has the gradient squared. Uh, then there is a linear term, which is multiplied by the curvature, the scalar curvature of the, of the surface. So there's a linear term in the field. And then there is this exponential. And there are some parameters. So the coefficient of the linear term, the coefficient of the exponential, and the coefficient of uh, here also. Now this uh, classical action goes back to the 19th century. That's why it's called Liouville. Uh, I mean, if, if you take this number Q here related to the gamma up here, and the two over gamma, and look at the Euler Lagrange equation of this action functional, then you get the Liouville equation. The Euler Lagrange, of course, is Laplacian x, blah, 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 this kind of equation, non linear equation. And if you write it, write it uh, geometrically, you see that this equation is just saying that the scalar curvature of the metric e to the gamma x times g is given by this constant here, a negative constant. So this is the equation for uh, the following problem. Given, given a Riemannian metric on your surface, find a multiplicative factor so that the new metric has constant negative curvature. And this was the approach by Picard and Poccaré to uniformization theorem, namely to, to show that the Riemann surfaces of genus two and more can be uniformized by the, by the disk. Uh, this idea was then taken by Polyakov in the eight, early eighties, where he argued that the natural probability law for Riemannian metrics on the surface you should, instead of taking the extremizers of this action, you should weight them by, by, by the Gibbs factor. And uh, this, was, this sort of idea was called quantum uniformization by 
by Dr. Sean and um, Zograf later. Okay, so that's the quantum Liouville model. We are supposed to try to understand this functional integral where uh, we have some observable and we want to uh, evaluate its uh, expected value in this functional integral where you weight field configurations by that kind of action function. What happens here is that uh, actually, the, like in the classical case, in this quantum case, the Q depends actually on gamma. It's not the classical value to go to a gamma, but it's renormalized a little bit, but still it depends on this number gamma here. It turns out that this mu dependence is completely uh, explicit in the sense that it, you can scale it actually by shifting the field. So mu is not really a parameter at all. So this theory has one parameter, the gamma, and it's not perturbative because the number here is not a perturbative parameter. So it's completely -perturb non-perturbative uh, uh, depending on one parameter. Uh, so it was, it, uh, it was uh, I, I said that this goes back to Polyakov at least uh, in this framework. And uh, of course, Liouville model was much earlier already. So it was uh, understood that it's, it's a sort of building block of trying to do string theory. In, away from the critical dimension. Uh, that, that was the motivation by Polyakov, but later it was sort of understood also that it's a way to do sort of random surfaces in two dimensions, namely doing the scaling limits of statistical physics models on random surfaces. And then this gamma here parameterizes what, what random surface you are talking about. So for instance, if you take easing model on a random surface on a planar map technically, then <clears throat> the scaling limit uh, of that thing should be had to do with Liouville model with this value of gamma, so square root of three. And then if you put, the, put other, other statistical mechanical models, then the gamma changes. It also has a miraculous uh, uh, connection to other quantum field theories, namely four-dimensional quantum field theories by, by correspondence due to uh, these people here. And, uh, and that's something which I think would be very interesting for mathematical physicists to understand a bit more. Anyway, so let's, uh, let's take uh, for uh, that we want to try to understand this model. Okay, it's a little bit more. So it's a conformal field theory. So we should now ask uh, like in the Polyakov uh, believe in polygon as a logical question, solve it, so find the spectrum and find, uh, find the structure constants. So the spectrum was conjectured uh, quite early, in 82 already by Cartwright and Thorne, uh, and they argue that it has to be continuous and the primary fields, this, these fields which have this nice transformation properties should be also exponential in the field X, just like the Liouville term in the, in the action functional. Uh, okay, so let's take it that that's the case. Then uh, the question is, what are the structure constants? Uh, <coughs> so uh, actually the motivation for Belyavin Polyakov as a Malachikov paper on conformal field theory was to, was to so solve Liouville model actually. And later if you read Polyakov's uh, autobiography, he writes that the whole business of BPC conformal field theory was an unsuccessful attempt to solve Liouville theory, which is very funny considering how influential it was. Anyway, they didn't find them, but it, the structure constants were found by, as I said, by these people here, and uh, they found a remarkable formula for them. And I just uh, flash you the formula so that you see that there is a formula. So it depends on the parameter mu. That's sort of what I said that everything is the scaling, scaling, it's scaling, so it's some power of, of mu. It depends on gamma and on the alphas. And, and it's given in terms of a special function, which is nowadays called as a homologic of epsilon function. It's related to double gamma functions, if you know what they are. Anyway, 
to put it mildly, it's, it's not simple, but it's explicit in some sense. And it's a, uh, it's a meromorphic function in this numbers alpha uh, with, with uh, uh, simple poles on, on, uh, on the real axis. Okay, I'm not going to use this formula anywhere, just to say that it exists. Uh, <coughs> Uh, once this formula was found, it was also then late, seen later that it solves these bootstrap equations numerically. So people started to believe it. I said that it, this formula was found. It was, one couldn't really say that it was actually derived in, uh, in a very sort of usual, usual meaning of the word, but it was found and uh, it satisfied the bootstrap, so it certainly has to be correct. Uh, and if you take that that's correct, then you would have the following formula for four-point function. I told you that then the four-point function should be a quadratic expansion, uh, expression in terms of the three-point functions. And once you uh, put the spectrum, what, what uh, Cotright and Thorne found, and take the, take the DOZZ, Cs, then you have an explicit formula for the four-point function, which is given by now an integral instead of a sum because the spectrum is continuous. So there are some factors, the, uh, it's quadratic in the C's, and then there's an explicit factor, which is purely a rep representation theoretic uh, thing. I, I will come back to that later, what, what that is. But, but uh, there's an explicit conjecture for the four point function. Okay, so that's the bootstrap approach to Liouville. How would you, actually derive these things uh, so from constructive Liouville theory. So uh, you would like to do something like the following. First, first of all, you should start by giving well-defined expressions. So give a mathematical feed, uh, meaning to the functional integral. And once you have that, then uh, of course, then you would have the three-point function, hopefully in some form. And then you would like to prove that it's given by this formula. And then, then after that, to prove the bootstrap. So that's what, what we will discuss now. First, the probabilistic formulation. For uh, mathematical physicists, this is not very surprising. Uh, of course, this is a super renormalizable quantum field theory. You have an action. We are in two dimensions. So if I have exponential of the field, it's still super renormalizable. And uh, uh, so defining, giving, uh, defining this functional integral is not necessarily the, uh, the hardest part of our program, but let's start with that. Uh, uh, so uh, of course we know from constructive field theory that to define these integrals, we usually want to do them by taking the Gaussian part separately. So, and saying that this is actually a Gaussian measure, and then you want to perturb the Gaussian measure. So, so uh, in this setup, uh, the Gaussian measure is called the Gaussian free field or the free field. And uh, concretely, uh, a nice way to express that is, is the following, is, is to think about it as a random eigenfunction with expansion. So let's look at the following field function, following functional z on the surface, which is uh, sum of uh, expansion where you have eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So there's a natural operator, of course, here. That's the Laplacian of the, of the uh, laplace Beltrami operator on the, on the surface. And um, uh, it's a compact surface, so it has a discrete spectrum. And, uh, and, I, uh, and then you do the eigenfunction expansion where there's a normalization factor for convenience. And then I put Xn's here, the coefficients are these Xn's, and they are uh, identically, uh, uh, independent ident identically distributed for uh, normal random variables, okay? If you take that kind of thing and compute expected value of product of this with another guy, like this, then you can sort of imagine that 
that you get something like a Green's function of the Laplacian because uh, you get one over eigenvalue squared and then there's some Planck array, etc. That's an exercise to figure that out. But uh, let's just do it like that. So let's set this x here then as follows. I take this Gaussian free field and then I add the one eigenfunction which is absent here and then the, the Laplacian has always the constant eigen, constant function on the surface. That's zero eigenvalue. So <coughs> that one doesn't enter into this expansion here. And that one we just put by hand. Uh, so uh, that's the constant mode or zero mode of the Laplacian. So there's a number C here, which is just uh, any, any real number. And then our functional integral uh, the Gaussian part of the functional integral is just concretely the Lebesgue measure in this coefficient and then product of, of normal random variable distributions, namely the product of simple Gaussians of the, of the, of the coefficients here. So that's, that's the Gaussian there, okay? Uh, <coughs> now you're supposed to uh, look at this too. This, time, this is linear in X, so that's not a problem, but let's, this is more of a problem because it's exponential. And of course, we know again what to do with that because uh, why is it a problem? It's a problem because the two dimensional free field has logarithmic similarity at coinciding points. So it's not clear a priori what it means to take nonlinear functions of it. And uh, the way to do it, of course, is to regularize it. So, instead of taking the infinite sum, you take a finite sum and, uh, and then renormalize, namely uh, do it, uh, multi multiply it by a constant so that you have a limit in the end. And uh, the renormalization is of course only just weak ordering, namely you take exponential of this regularized thing and, and uh, subtract uh, the, the variance squared times gamma squared over two. Uh, okay, so this, uh, uh, well, uh, the right way to look at this object is actually to think about it as a measure. And uh, once you take this limit, then this measure is so multiplied by Lebesgue measure, so that's a random measure. And as n goes to infinity, this random measure converges almost surely in the weak sense to a limit. And the limit uh, is a very well known and a lot of, lot of studied uh, question in probability, it's called the Gaussian multiplicative chaos measure on the surface. There's lots of nice properties which we are not going to discuss at all here. Let's just mention that this limit exists, is non-trivial only when this parameter gamma is not too big, namely less than two. And in that case, uh, it's a nice measure, so for instance, the total, total volume of the, of the surface is a well-defined random variable. And, uh, and so on. Okay, so that takes care of that. And, and now we have the probabilistic Liouville theory. Uh, there's the linear term, which is, uh, I said that it shouldn't be too bad, and indeed it's not. It has two pieces. There is the constant uh, integral of the curvature over the whole surface is the other characteristic. So that's just a constant. And then there is the integral of of, uh, of the field itself, and that's that's fine, that's well defined. And the Liouville theory then is defined as follows: you take an observable, which depends on this x, uh, then the, this axiomatic thing, this uh, expectation, is given by the following explicit expression: you take expected value in the Gaussian free field, integrate over the Lebesgue variable, weight it by this explicit factor here, and in the expectation by these explicit factors here. And in the same way, the correlation functions to the primary fields, the same story. To do, to do them, you need to weak order them again, but in the end of the day, uh, then uh, you, have, uh, you have such expressions, okay? So this was the story uh, how 
we started with uh, Remy Avanzar and, and, uh, and uh, François David uh, to study this uh, model. And, uh, and the first thing is that uh, this correlation functions indeed, the limit exists. Uh, and uh, and uh, the limit exists and is non trivial, depends a bit by what these alphas are. So if the alphas are not too big, and if their sum is big enough, then the, the correlation functions exist and are non-trivial. And in that case, then they satisfy these uh, different morphism and wild axioms, which I, which I stated in the beginning. With a central charge, which is this explicit number here, depending on the parameter Q, which if you remember was function of the gamma, okay? Uh, these two conditions are not that surprising if you look at this integral here. Clearly, you need some condition on this simple zero mode integral to converge because this is exponential in C. Uh, when C goes to minus infinity, you get nothing from here, right? Because this, this disappears as C goes to minus infinity. So this has to be, this thing here has to be negative in order that to converge at minus infinity. So that's a simple thing, okay? This, this one here. Uh, the other one that they shouldn't be too big is more subtle. I'm not going to go to it. It has some, it has, uh, has to do with the regularity of the multiplicative chaos. And, uh, uh, but let's just take it. Uh, <clears throat> but they shouldn't be too big and not too small. So in the case of the sphere, actually, what happens is that the, the first correlation functions, which are well-defined and finite, are the three-part functions. Well, that's exactly what we want because we want the structure constants, but anyway. So the probabilistic theory uh, deals with real alphas, satisfying these bounds. And if you remember when I told you what the spectrum by, of Cotrite and Thorn is, these are not in the spectrum at all. Okay, so you might ask, uh, what about the structure constants? Uh, <coughs> So the structure constants, I told you that all these correlation functions make sense if the alphas are suitable. Uh, and uh, just to show you that there is a probabilistic expansion expression, if you do, you can sort of integrate out the zero mode and you get a very concrete expression in terms of multiplicative chaos, namely it's some moment, inverse moment of you integrate with this exponential of the free field, some, some number, some function which has singularities at origin, at one, at, at infinity. And, uh, and then uh, there's an explicit factor in front of it. This is something which you can put into computer, this, and try to check whether the uh, DOZZ formula holds. Uh, but actually, uh, you can prove that it actually does. Uh, without computer, so uh, and this was the, uh, <coughs> what we did some time ago with uh, Remy and Vincent. Uh, namely, if you take this probabilistic expression here, and if you take the alphas satisfying the cyber bounds, then actually this expression is exactly the same as the DOZZ formula. That the formula with the epsilon function. Proof is a long story, I won't go to it in this talk. Uh, <coughs> it's probably, it uses a lot of probabilistic analysis of the Gaussian multiplicative chaos to derive certain algebraic identities. Of course, you're never going to get this formula unless you get some identities in the end and, and that's what the proof consists of. Uh, identities for the structure constants that actually determine them uniquely and and give this formula. So what I want to do the rest of the talk is to uh, tell the other part of the story, namely why the, how the bootstrap comes. Okay, so let's take it. So we have a defin probabilistic definition for the four point function. There is uh, some very similar formula as for the three point function. Now there are four points. So by Möbius invariants, invariants, you can move them wherever you want, except for one of them. So let's move 
free of them to zero, one, and infinity, and keep one, then the one is 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 on the, on the somewhere on the plane. Okay. Uh, so we, this is a function of one complex variable, a four-point function, and it depends on the alphas, of course. It has a, it has a formula given by this probabilistic expression, multiplied with chaos, you integrate it again an explicit function. Never mind too much about it. It's explicit and it has singularities at the insertion points, and it makes sense. It's finite and non-trivial if the alphas satisfy the bounds we had before. The bootstrap conjecture is that this somehow should be given in terms of three point functions. And uh, in terms of sum over uh, the spectrum and some quadratic factors and coefficients. So here's the theorem, uh, uh, which uh, uh, goes together uh, with Remy and Vincent and, uh, and uh, uh, Guillermo. <coughs> so the, it says the following. So let, let this alpha satisfy this cyborg bounds. So and let's, 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 let me not go to why I make this assumption, but let's just assume that uh, say alpha one and alpha two are bigger than Q and alpha three and alpha four are bigger than Q. Remember that sum has to be bigger than two Q. So this is consistent with that. Then the four point function has an explicit formula. Namely, you take its quadratic in the structure constants, you integrate the sum over the spectrum, but I told you that the spectrum is, is continuous, so it's an integral over the spectrum. Uh, there are some explicit factors which are purely representation theoretical and uh, they go under the name holomorphic conformal blocks. So, We'll come to that in a moment, but uh, <clears throat> that's the result. Uh, 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 so let's, let's go how this actually is proven. Now, uh, uh, in nutshell, the idea is the following. So you express the correlation functions as scalar products and, uh, and, and the spectrum which enters here actually uh, has is really has something to do with the spectrum. It's a spectrum actually of the Hamiltonian operator or the quantum field theory. So you, you go to a Hilbert space representation of, of the theory, like write the correlation functions in the Hilbert space formulation. The spectrum is the Hamiltonian, and then the Z dependence, which is here, comes using conformal symmetry. So let's start with the scalar product. This again is familiar with, uh, with uh, mathematical physicists, <coughs> namely uh, we have a, a reflection positive quantum field theory here. I mean, it's just a usual free field and, uh, and uh, an exponential interaction. Uh, in this conformal business, we are working on the sphere, so uh, this is uh, <coughs> maybe not completely what uh, everybody is used to, but uh, uh, you get to what you are used to by going, going basically writing. You, you should think about the radius, take the sphere, the, the, the plane, and take the radius, uh, plays the role of the time, and then space is the is the angular variable here. And so <coughs> the Hilbert space then is something uh, which has to do with the fields in positive times. So you take functionals that depend on the field, field on the disk. Okay. And then you have a reflection operator with, with, uh, in the complex plane, which reflects your Z to Z bar inverse. So you reflect you reflect in the, uh, uh, on the boundary of the disk, and uh, that extends to a reflection in the, uh, in, the, in the space of fields by just uh, the, ob in the obvious way. So if you have a field which depends, uh, if you have an observable which depends on the fields in the disk, the reflective one depends on the outside of the disk. 
So in time, this would be in that you go from positive time to negative time. And then the scalar product uh, in, this, uh, in this Hilbert space uh, is just given by, uh, you take two observables which depend on the fields of the disk, reflect the other one, and take expected value in the functional integral. Okay? And reflection positivity is the property that uh, once you do this and you take f scalar product with itself, you get something which is non negative. Okay, so uh, let's uh, practice it in the four point function. So uh, if I take a four point function, let's take one, uh, the points. Uh, the z now inside the unit disk. If it's outside, then everything gets reversed. So let's keep it inside. Uh, then uh, this clearly I can write. This is a, this is in my F D. This depends on the fields inside the disk. This depends on the fields outside of the disk. So I can write this as a scalar product of this vector, namely this guy here, and this reflected, namely that again at one, and infinity in the reflection goes to zero. So this is in the disk, this is in the disk. So the four point function is a scalar product of two vectors, uh, where you have two of the points on this side and two of the points on the other side. All right, so we have succeeded writing functional integrals as scalar products. Uh, well, once you have a scalar product, you can always start thinking that maybe in here I could insert the decomposition of the unity, namely using the spectral resolution of the Hamiltonian of the, of the quantum field theory. That's a good idea here. And that's what the bootstrap is actually based on. So let's try to do that. So the first question is what is the Hamiltonian? Well, again, uh, that, uh, I told you that this, uh, Time is really the radial variable. So if you dilate the z by e to the minus t, where t is positive, then that maps the disk to itself. And obviously, once you extend it then to functionals of the field, uh, it maps the, uh, the fd to itself. Okay. And uh, this dilations, these dilations form a, form a semigroup. So these objects here also form a semigroup. And, uh, and they actually form a contraction semigroup uh, whose generator is the Hamiltonian of the quantum field theory. This is the thing uh, which in the usual formalism, formalism uh, when you are on the plane and you do uh, translation in the, in the time direction. Here is the radial direction. Okay, so the generator uh, and, uh, and uh, indeed you can now in this framework, uh, this goes through and you can, you get a positive self-adjoint uh, self operator in, in your Hilbert space for all gamma less than two. I told you that only gamma less than two, the theory was, was defined like it was defined. Well, of course, uh, uh, we don't usually work in constructive field theory with uh, uh, the Hilbert space depending on all the times before uh, or after the zero, you want to go to the time zero space. So here time zero means the equator of the sphere or the boundary of the disk. So this functional integral here where you have a function of the fields inside the disk and outside of the disk, you would like to reduce it to an integral over the boundary, namely over the fields in the boundary. And this is uh, quite straightforward, of course, this is well known. You read the book by Glim and Jaffe and start told, told there how to do it. <clears throat> so you look at the field on the boundary. Uh, so if you restrict, restrict it on the boundary, the field is a function of an angle, okay, the circle, the boundary of the disk is the circle. And if you look what the free field looks when, when you put it on the circle, then this is what it looks like. It's a random Fourier series now, where the coefficients uh, 
uh, are complex numbers uh, whose real and imag imaginary parts are normal random variables. Okay, so one of square, square root of n again is the factor which gives you the right singularity once you compute the two-point function. Okay, so that's that's what your uh, variables should be in the Hilbert space. You should have this random Fourier series, this coefficients here, and then the constant mode. And that, of course, goes through. And then you do it uh, for the Liouville. You plug, de uh, decompose the field here, and, uh, and the result is the following. There's a, you can re represent this Hilbert space in the, in the L2 space of these variables, namely the C and this coefficients here, L2, the Lebec measure, and then the Gaussian measure corresponding to this coefficients. Okay, there's a unitary map from, from what we had before to the L, L2 space of the, of, the, of the free field on the boundary. So the two-point functions of the, what we had before can be written as two-point functions in this scalar product here, in this Hilbert space here. And we denote it by H. Okay, so what does the uh, Hamiltonian then look like? This abstract Hamiltonian coming from the dilation. Well, everybody who has studied quantum field theory knows what it looks like. Uh, <coughs> it, it's of course for the free field, there's a free field part and the interaction. Free field part is, has creation and annihilation operators. Uh, in this two-dimensional setup, there are sort of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic creation and annihilation operators. And, uh, and then there is the constant mode, which is just a free particle. So there is a second derivative in the C, so that's uh, second derivative in the, in, the, in the variable C, so that's a free particle motion. And then the uh, non-linearity, the Liouville term, of course, is e to the gamma times the field, which had two pieces, so e to the gamma c, and then this multiplicative chaos integrated over the circle. And the, the creation operator, the annihilation operator is just, in these variables, is just the derivative in the nth Fourier component, the complex derivative in the nth Fourier component. That's a concrete Hamiltonian. Uh, but we need to find a complete set of eigenfunctions for it. By the way, uh, 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 the chairman, uh, Daniel, uh, how long I'm, uh, did I speak um, when I'm supposed to stop? I'm supposed to stop. Yeah, we still have five minutes, if that's okay. 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 <coughs> okay, so we are supposed to diagonalize this. Okay, how do you do it? So let's see, how would you, what should it look, what should uh, the eigenfunctions look like? So let, let's look at the simple model where I drop these oscillators, this infinite dimensional business of oscillators, just keep the zero mode. So, so then I have a Schrodinger operator with a wall potential, the so potential e to the gamma c. Okay, so this is Schrodinger operator on the line uh, with potential which goes to infinity at, on, on the right and goes to zero on the left. Okay, so it's a, everybody knows what, how this should behave. This, of course, describes scattering from a wall. And of course, the eigenstate should look like eigenstates of the free guy at minus infinity, namely e to the ip times c. And, uh, and then they should go to zero plus infinity because there is the wall. So they should be a reflected. So they should really look like a wave going, uh, moving with uh, velocity p and reflected wave, okay? At minus infinity. And there is some reflection coefficient. And of course, this is trivial. This is probably you can write explicitly the eigenfunctions in terms of Bessel functions and it's uh, end of the story for the toy, toy model. Uh, the eigenvalues are from, you can read from here, of course, uh, 
from here you get p squared and here you get there's a constant here the q which is hanging around here so there is a q squared there well let's have the oscillators uh, and before going to the Liouville, let's just to keep the free free field part the h zero okay so now i now i just keep this part I don't use the v well uh, what what is add, added then is that you have uh, all the oscillators but uh, in this massless free field you can represent that uh, there is actually a hidden symmetry here because after all the massless theory is also a conformal field theory and uh, there are actually two uh, Virasaur algebras which are the, uh, represent the conformal symmetry uh, with the central charge which we had before and the Hamiltonian so the, I call them L and L tilde and they are two commuting algebras sort of the left-handed and the right-handed if you wish or the holomorphic and the anti-holomorphic and the Hamiltonian is a sum of the two L zeros and then there is a whole whole uh, number of other operators here and uh, and then the eigenfunctions of h0 they are uh, then the eigenfunctions of what we had for the for the constant mode maybe, maybe this plane waves and then descendants coming where you put the oscillators in this Virasaur algebra fashion so there are there's a highest weight state in which is annihilated by the positive uh, frequencies here and eigenvalues with the L0 and then uh, the, uh, the same thing with the L tilde and everybody else is a descent. And now I'm almost done. I think I have one minute so let me let me just say what is our main theorem. The full Liouville Hamiltonian has a complete set of generalized eigenfunctions which look at when you go in this C but they are, they are functions of C and of this infinitely many Fourier components when you go to minus infinity they look like these guys which we have here plus some reflected ways they, there's a complete set where inner products are delta functions they are generalized eigenfunctions so delta functions in the p variable just like you would have in the in the usual uh, uh, scattering problem on the wall and then some explicit factors which come from the descendants okay so now you can do Plancherel. the four point function was in the product of this vector and that vector so you put a uh, resolution of the complete set of eigenstates they are not orthonormal so there are these crumb matrices but they are uh, determined so you get now that then integral over the spectrum of the p you in integrate and sum over the s so what is still missing here is to connect these inner products here to the structure constants and that's my last slide uh, so you have the fields you have the eigenfunctions so these are i'm now in the uh, in the disk formulation so i have this uh, uh, vector in the hilbert space in the disk in the disk formulation this psi is you take the eigenfunction in the fox space you take it back into your the unitary map into your field space so it's some capital psi and this guy is nothing but the DOZC formula with Q plus IP and explicit factors which come from the conformal symmetry. And the heuristic explanation for that is that uh, this should really look like descendants of some primary field. And when you try to figure out what it is, it should be the vertex operator with this alpha here. And then if I just take these coefficients to zeros and just take the primary field, then that, that should be the three-point function with one point at infinity, the DOZZ form. 
problem here is that there are there is no local field like that and the actual proof uh, is more involved uh, <coughs> uh, what you need to do is actually uh, uh, take these eigenfunctions analytically continue to, to the real line then we are in the probabilistic business we can do all these conformal word identities and things like that and and then analytic continuation back gives you this formula so the true story is slightly more complicated the fact that there is no local field corresponding to the states in the spectrum is of course a famous problem of Liouville theory goes back a long time ago people noticed that there are sort of funny thing happening in this non-compact non -compact, uh, conformal field theories is that the the, <coughs> the states in the spectrum don't actually correspond to local fields like unlike in the compact case where if you think about the easing model for instance then the spectrum uh, uh, consists of three points the, there is the identity there is the spin and the energy energy field and uh, and these are local fields but here in the Liouville they are not local fields so this is a slightly different story so the bootstrap now follows because of that and then then uh, the conformal blocks come because of this explicit factors which we had here so to summarize <coughs> maybe it's nice to compare this com uh, compact and non-compact uh, uh, conformal field theories to harmonic analysis of compact groups and non-compact groups for compact groups it's algebraic for SE2 for instance representations are finite dimensional and you do algebra but if you do SL2 then you have to do analysis and here in conformal field theory story stories are the parallels from that point of view uh, there it's the Casimir operator and here it's the Hamiltonian but uh, uh, but again it's uh, about the spectrum in one case it's discrete and in one case it's continuous so I think I went over time but and thank you. Well, thank you very much. A very nice presentation. Are there questions? Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, uh, is, is there an easy argument why uh, you have a, a restriction on the value of gamma in the Liouville model? yeah well easy uh, okay so <clears throat> no it's it, it's a non-trivial fact okay so uh, once uh, gamma pro what happens when it, okay as a, as a, where, where do i have it Let's see. okay yeah okay so uh, this is actually a marking uh, so the limit exists always that was what uh, Kahan proved. But then he also uh, noted that uh, actually when gamma is equal to two or bigger, then this limit actually is zero. And, and uh, that's a that sort of a story which was uh, parallelly understood in mathematical physics. People were looking at this, these exponentials of the free field. Um, I mean, if you know the Derrida Spawn uh, story about uh, trees, uh, <coughs> disordered systems with uh, uh, there's a similar problem uh, working there. Namely, when gamma passes the number two, then what happens is that instead of getting getting this, then this this measure here gets peaked around its it's uh, maxima or minima well i suppose in this case around its maxima and and uh, the limit ac actually if you want to get a non-trivial limit first of all you need to do more than just weak order so there's a logarithmic correct so the weak ordering is of course uh, uh, this behaves like uh, like a logarithmic term in the if you put a spatial cutoff it would be a logarithmic term so so that would be here a multiplicative term by the epsilon to some power and uh, what, need, what needs to be done is, is there's an extra logarithmic term 
in the epsilon, which you have to add here in order to get the non-trivial limit. But that limit then lives sort of, uh, will, be, will be a measure, purely atomic measure. So, so, so answer to your question is, it's not a completely trivial thing, okay? And, uh, and uh, the, when <clears throat> there's a story of that in, in physics, people wanted to do Liouville theory, not for gamma less than two, but for uh, sort of different gammas. This, this is something people wanted to do string theory in, for instance, uh, in four dimensions. And uh, for that, you needed Liouville, not in this re regime of gamma, but uh, in the re regime which is not covered by here. And uh, this is still a problem which is not, not uh, resolved. So uh, translating to string theory, we, are do, uh, we can do non, non, this, this way of doing, you do non-critical strings in one space time dimension. Uh, can one take, uh, uh, let's say, an imaginary gamma and maybe yes. take a sine uh, or cosine? Yes. Okay. So, uh, indeed, if you take imaginary gamma, the Liu will, uh, and if you think, look at it, for instance, in the bootstrap uh, formulation, you can analytically continue in gamma. So, this formula, say the DOZZ formula, for instance, was analytic function of gamma also. And, and uh, going, uh, doing imaginary gamma, you would, uh, of course, hope to get into, into this uh, regime, which we don't understand here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's very difficult to try to prove uh, the study analytics in gamma in this probabilistic formulation. So this is something which is not, not understood. Now we asked about cosine. Of course, I could take cosine, uh, <coughs> and then instead of Liu, we'll, we would have the uh, Sangoro model. That's not that's no more conformal field theory anymore. That's a, uh, the regime there again would be the analog of gamma. Usually, it's called beta, namely the inverse temperature. And in this uh, in these units. There's a critical value beta equal to two, which is the Kosterlis-Thales point, and uh, beta less than two is the phase which we are studying here. Uh, that's the high temperature phase of the of the of the um, model, model, which is super anomalizable field theory, and uh, and that indeed, of course, constructively, you know what to do with. If you go beyond beta equal to two, you are then in that case you are in the in the low temperature phase where where you understand the infrared behavior very well, but the ultraviolet behavior is is, is completely different. So there is an analog there also of the same problem actually. I don't know if I answered your question. Well, I, 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 think, I think so. So, uh, so okay, uh, just to continue, uh, what is special about the exponential? Uh, so, so if you take any other function uh, uh, rather than exponential, uh, you, I mean, you can also construct it. Uh, this is super normalizable, uh, as you said. Yes. Uh, it's the only, it's the one which is uh, uh, conformally invariant. Uh, okay, so the, it, it is only the exponential that gives... Only the exponential. exponential. So if you take P5 2, for instance, of course, there, uh, take uh, Phi 4 model. Okay, there are two parameters, the coupling constant and the mass, right? And you know that there should exist a critical value of the mass depending on the coupling constant so that uh, you are at the critical point. This is still not a conformal field theory. This is a theory which is super, uh, ultraviolet. It looks like a free field and in infrared, it looks like non-trivial fixed point. But you can of course take now scaling limit of that model, the ultra scaling limit and in that scaling limit, then it, that would be a conformal field theory. It's not anymore, doesn't anymore look like uh, the functional integral wouldn't be any for anymore the P phi two, it would be whatever, I don't know. 
but uh, uh, but certainly certainly you expect there to be a conformally invariant model there but but first of all how would you even find the concrete the critical point we don't know what mass we should take there but in this new what what we are in a happy situation is that it's explicitly as, as it's written, it's explicitly conformally invariant. The only thing which uh, is that the weak, you have to be careful with the weak ordering and that, uh, that contributes to this change in the, in the Q, Q parameter, which I had here. So this is the classical value and the weak ordering produces oh. come over to. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, further questions? This is Martin Sernwall. I would like to ask the following. There, there is a kind of reflection symmetry sending alpha, the, the index of the primary field, to, to Q minus alpha. Yes. Um, you didn't talk about that. Can you comment on this? Um, yes, this is the essential part of the DOZZ story, okay? Uh, let's see, I think I have a slide here. Let's see. Here. Uh, okay. So uh, here is the DOZZ story. Uh, it's, it's this formula here. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you take the DOZZ formula, uh, then it seems to have a symmetry, namely, uh, as you say, uh, if I replace e to the alpha phi by a number times e to the 2q minus alpha phi, then I get, uh, uh, again, I mean, this is, this is a symmetry of the, of, this, of, of the strange formula what we had. Okay, so here's the symmetry, which you mentioned. And this is the main thing for which this was the main point we needed to understand to prove the DOZZ formula was this reflection symmetry. And, and this looks of course very strange because it says, I mean, ordinary numbers don't satisfy this, right? <clears throat> so in the end of the day, what, and, uh, and even, even more so because we know that, uh, I told you that the correlation functions are well-defined when alpha is less than Q, but then 2q minus alpha is bigger than q, right? And what actually happens is that when two alpha is bigger than q, the correlation functions are identically zero, these probabilistic ones. So this can't hold literally. And actually it holds by analytic continuation. Okay, so indeed it's true. Uh, probabilistically you have this for the real alphas. They agree with the DOZZ formula and they actually are analytic functions and they have an analytic continuation and analytic continuation satisfies this form. And actually part of the proof for us, uh, the big, biggest part in, in our proof was to understand how, probabilistically how you get into this R. I don't have a formula for the R here, but it's, that's an explicit formula. Uh, oh, here it is, yeah, it's, it's a formula like this. So, uh, and th this, th this turns, out to, uh, turns, turns out to be a probabilistic origin for this formula and uh, again has have to do with multiple the chaos, but okay, that would require another talk to, to do that. But, but uh, you're, you're completely right. This is, this is the crucial thing here. There's another crucial thing in the DOZZ formula is uh, there's sort of a symmetry also in the in the Liouville, namely gamma gamma going to two over gamma symmetry. If gamma is less than two, now gamma going to four over gamma. Uh, yeah, gamma going to four over gamma symmetry. So if gamma is less than two, then four over gamma is bigger than two. The formula is again symmetric, the DOZZ formula, and this was again a headache in the old days of Liouville when people were trying to understand because uh, 
because it's not clear the, uh, the action doesn't have the symmetry. Nevertheless, the solution seems to have the symmetry. And th that's what comes from our, our analysis that indeed the, the action doesn't have the symmetry, but the solution has the symmetry. So that's very much similar, uh, sort of analogous to this question here. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I, I have another question. What is the meaning of, of the expression multiplicative chaos? Ah, uh, not very, well, okay, that's pretty much the, well, what is chaos? Okay, okay chaos re refers here to Wiener chaos, right? So, uh, uh, Wiener chaos is based on Brownian motion, right? And you have independent increments. And uh, this is sort of an exponential version of it. Okay, so instead of having some sums of independent uh, objects, you have products. So that's the multiplic. That's why I think that's where the came, uh, name came uh, when this was. Not even sure. Maybe Remy knows who in introduced the name, but I think it was Kahala. Maybe it, it might have been even Mandelbrot who introduced this. It was name. Olivier. It was who? Paul Levy. Paul, Paul, Levy. Paul Levy. Okay. Asked to Kahn to, to define this multiplicative, multiplicative chaos thing because, uh, as you said, uh, it, it's related to the Wiener chaos in a multiplicative way. But it was Paul Levy. Okay. Um, if I may add a comment. Hi, Antti. Uh, so oh, nice, to, <laughs> nice to see this uh, long expected picture to be put on firm grounds uh, by now. So that is uh, wonderful. Uh, just uh, concerning, as it came up, the, the question uh, concerning imaginary gamma. Um, this, I think, would be uh, another step to take because uh, I mean not even DOZZ formula is uh, actually analytic uh, when you go to imaginary gamma so this is related to the fact that uh, you expect the analytic continuation to work until central charge C equals to one but imaginary gamma would be then below C equals to one so there's a barrier really where uh, we still need to work harder. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that that really is something which would be nice to understand. But uh, at the moment, uh, this doesn't look so easy from the probabilistic point of view. Further questions? I mean, perhaps one last question. If not, well, thank you very much, Antti. Thank you.